Hello and welcome to episode number 13, 13 on the dot of the Lucas and Lucas podcast. Don't shake your head at me. This is actually the 13th episode. Last week was the 12th episode. Mike foolishly referred to it as the 13th episode. Classic mistake by him, but we got it, it just stinks when you come up with a bit with your co-partner and then literally immediately after the bit is executed, he throws you under the bus and is like, no, that's a bad bit. You're an idiot. So for the record, we had agreed to never know what episode number it is, but Franco's meticulous note-keeping skills force him to stay on track. And yes, I said the wrong show number last week. Guess what? I don't care. I'm not sorry. I'm not apologizing for anything. Well, you're just confusing everyone that listens to this show. I know. Just com- ruining their mindset, but whatever. So I thought we were to come on today and we we're going to talk about how the Giants were full game lead for first place. The division was theirs for the taking. It was over. And then on Monday, just the apocalypse of 2020 takes a new turn. The Steelers, the undefeated Steel Curtain Pittsburgh Steelers, somehow managed to lose a game to the Washington football team. They, they, they led 14 to nothing. It's only the second time in the Roethlisberger era that they've blown a lead of 14 points and lost. Washington and the Giants are now tied Giants, obviously on the tiebreaker because they beat them twice. But, man, just when I thought I had this division figured out, it keeps it keeps changing. And I, I, I don't know what's making this anymore. Uh, it feels like this is the – I mean, I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen going forward. What, what the hell is happening in the NFC East? Well, your first mistake was thinking for any point in time you had this division figured out. Because if we've learned anything this year, it's that nothing makes sense. It's the Giants and the Washington football team. I, I still want to say Redskins. The Washington football team, I think, caught the right opponents at the right time. I don't think New York is better than Seattle, and I don't think Washington is better than Pittsburgh. But they happen to catch those teams at the right time. And maybe more importantly, I think it shows the importance of good coaching. Joe Judge and Ron Rivera, this is their first years with their respective teams. They had no preseason, an unconventional training camp, and both teams started off extremely slow. I think that goes to show that it takes time to implement your system, to implement, you know, to to get your team to buy into what exactly they're supposed to do, what they want to do on both sides of the ball. And we've seen both of these teams get better and better on a weekly basis. Now, On the flip side of that, you have the Dallas Cowboys, who also have a brand new head coach, but I don't think you can really evaluate Mike McCarthy this season because they lost Dak Prescott so early and that quarterback situation has been such a complete catastrophe. So I think he actually gets a little bit of a pass in that regard. But Joe Judge and Ron Rivera are good coaches, and I think it's hard to argue against that. And these two teams, with the progressions they've made in the last eight weeks specifically, it seems like they are getting uh, more complex Defense, both teams are getting more complex defensively on a week by week basis. I think that comes with familiarity and just reps that you should have had in training camp that you didn't get. And good coaching in this league is the great equalizer. The Patriots talent this year should have, should, should merit them a top three pick. Bill Belichick has them at six and six or seven. What's the record? Six and six, six and six, six and six and putting Frankel's bet in jeopardy of them actually hitting the, if they beat the Rams on Thursday night, Frank, they have a legitimate shot to make the playoffs, and that roster is a train wreck. So coaching is the great equalizer in this league. I'm not saying Mike Tomlin's not a great coach. I think there are a couple other reasons. The Steelers sputtered out last night, but I think it just goes to show that without an offseason, you cannot get your team ready or where you want them to be at week one. It's just not plausible, especially with a brand-new system. And the Giants are hitting their stride late. The Redskins are hitting their – The Redskins are doing this. Who? The, the football team, I apologize. Oh. The football team is hitting their stride late. With Alex Smith at quarterback, he was their third or fourth string quarterback to start the season, which makes no sense that he's the guy that has kind of been in the right spot at the right time when this is all coming together. But I just think the NFC East speaks to the importance of coaching and without off seasons, without preseasons, without traditional training camps, it is taking longer for those coaches to implement and mold their team to what they want to be. And what they want their teams to be are successful, uh, competitive franchises. So two points off that. One, Mike. McC- so you're making the excuse for Mike McCarthy. Look at what, what, what I think he's a bad. I think he's a bad coach, but he gets a pass because he's been dealing with a quarterback catastrophe. But so is so is Washington. So yeah. So no, no. Mike McCarthy does not get a pass for this. That team is an abomination. They've been. They were an abomination on defense while they had. They were terrible with Dak. Like 
they, they okay. probably would have won. They probably would have ended up winning the division, but they were what one in four when he got hurt. I mean, it's not Dallas. like they were playing. Dallas. They were not. They were not playing this. You know, powerhouse. You know, elite level football, and then they lose their quarterback in their season, falls off a cliff. That's not. That's not by any means how that was going. Number two. You know Bill Belichick right now. He spills blood in the water because if he finishes with the same record or a better record than Brady with that roster, and you look at Brady's roster, that would be the crowning achievement of Belichick's career. There would be I nothing agree. that would satisfy him more than with the cast cavalcade of just nobodies on that team. How they managed to have the same record as a team with Tom Brady, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, Rob Gronkowski, Nadamikins. I mean, just. Imagine how – if Belichick was the coach of the Buccaneers right now, what would the record be? 12-2? and 12-2. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not even possible. 10-2, uh, and 11-2, whatever the, the number is. They probably have two losses. It, it, that- it, it's silly what, what Belichick is doing with that roster. And I had the under on nine and a half wins. And I, I, I felt great when they were four and six. And now you're they're sweating. six. You're legitimately. I could see. I could see the beads of sweat going down the side of your face right now. But they, listen, the rant. Listen, here's the situation. So Cam Newton, his last two games, I pulled up the stats here. He's completed uh, 21 out of 37 passes for 153 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. And they're two and zero in those games against the Cardinals. A game they won 20 to 17. Guess what his QBR was? 21.3. 5.6. Oh. And they won. I don't know how they're doing it. It's, it is just pure magic. Uh, Bell, I mean, you knew going to that. I, I wish I would have played on the freaking Patriots against the Chargers because you knew going in that game, Justin Herbert was going to look like a lost puppy in the woods. And, and was there it, ever, was there ever a bigger coaching mismatch than Belichick and Anthony Lynn? I mean, I, honest to goodness, I don't think there ever has been. I mean, and, and you look at the, the talent discrepancy on, on those teams. I mean, Herbert, Keenan Allen, Eckler. Mike Williams. Mike Williams. I mean, that, that offense by the Chargers is exponentially more talented than the Patriots. And the fact that the Patriots won that game 45 nothing is just – I mean, people are saying it. I mean, what, say what you want, whatever. Patriots, I thought they were going to win 14-3. to three, They ended up being 45 nothing. That's, that's not That's not like – the Patriots aren't 45 points better than the Chargers. And if they played again, the Patriots probably win 10-7. But it, it, it's just this, – this season as a whole – I, I, I I don't know what to make of it. It, it, throw, it keeps throwing me for a loop. And another team that keeps throwing me for a loop, I know we're going a little bit out of aura here, but the Kansas City Chiefs, the reigning Super Bowl champs, 10-1. and one, After they beat the Jets 35-9, here, here's their, how they've fared since then. They beat the Panthers 33-31, the Raiders 35-31, the Buccaneers 27-24, and the Broncos 22-16. This team, the, 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 this juggernaut, can't beat a team by more than one touchdown. I mean, what is happening? They're 0-4 against the spread in the last four games. These are the reigning Super Bowl champs. This, the, the Patrick Mahomes, the greatest quarterback of our generation, can barely beat – I mean, what, what – what, what, I, I, I don't know what's happening. I think when you reach a certain level of success, it is hard to get up for a game-for-game game basis, especially against divisional opponents when you already know you have a playoff spot locked up. And truthfully, I don't – I think Kansas City feels like it needs that number one seed in the bye to win another Super Bowl. I, I think they're kind of just going through the motions and the proverbial switch has not been flipped yet. And I think that's a dangerous line to tiptoe, but I'm not worried about Kansas City. They're still winning. They're winning without trying, it feels like. It feels like they're sleepwalking and they're still 10-1. and one. And if you asked me today, put my entire life savings on, a, on one team to win the Super Bowl, I wouldn't hesitate. It would all go to Kansas City and I wouldn't think twice about it. Uh, so, yeah, it, has it been pretty? No. Should they be crushing these teams by more? Yeah. But in my word at all, not, not in the slightest. I, I think they know when push comes to shove, they can flip the switch. And you saw it against Carolina a couple weeks ago. They were down, needed to come back. All right, no problem. Came back. They were down against Denver. Oh, we're gonna, oh let's just go score here, whatever. We'll win the game. No biggie. So, like, yeah, is it is it pretty? No, but I just I don't think they're really trying. I really don't think they're trying. So I, 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 the best example of that is against the Raiders when they were when they were when they, were, they were trailing and Mahomes was like, all right, we have like what we, we have like just over a minute to go, and it was like it was like clockwork, boom, 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 touchdown, Kelsey, game over, and they won. And they're, yeah. they're literally doing just enough to win every single one of these games. They're doing the bare minimum it takes to win on a week to week basis. Conventional wisdom says that 
when that calendar turns to January and they and it's a playoff game that they'll flip the switch. But I mean, again, what, with what we're dealing with, I've given up trying to figure out how this season's going to play out. The, the, the only consistent thing this year has been Kansas City finding a dumb way to, or not a dumb way, but some way to win a game. That's really the only thing consistent. I guess Pittsburgh to the same extent because they have not been relatively pretty in their 11 and 0 start. I think we're going to get to them next, but the the only consistent thing is when Patrick Mahomes needs a touchdown, the Chiefs get one. I mean, plain and simple. When they need a touchdown, the Chiefs get one. And they play New Orleans, not this week, but next week, Frank. I think that's a game we see the Chiefs get up for. And I and, and I think that's a barometer. If that game comes down and they either get smoked or they don't come out and look like they're really trying, then it's like, okay, maybe this team has that switch that can't be flipped. The switch is stuck on you know, level three when it needs to be at level 10 for the playoffs. But I think that's a game if we see them get up for, uh, I'll, I'll feel pretty confident in them moving forward to the playoffs. So that game is in New Orleans. I guess presumably Drew Reed will be back for that game. If you're a bookmaker, what would the spread be for that game? In New Orleans? In New Orleans. Uh, Chiefs by three and a half. Okay, I was going to say Chiefs by three. I mean, you, you can't make them underdogs. Three and a half. The three and a half thing has been a killer or betting on the Chiefs because they keep winning these one, two to three point games. And I was actually really nervous because I had them. I had them by three and a half. You hear against that? Denver? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, I had them by three and a half against Denver. If they missed that field goal at the end, then uh, <laughs> then I would have gotten screwed. But thankfully, they and I was actually terrified that, that Kelsey was going to get the first down and that would have screwed up that bet too. But it all ended up paying out. But I, I mean, Every week I want to put all my money on, on, on the Chiefs, but they, like I said, I mean, I, it, it's just. I do too. I, I do too. And they, and they keep just barely winning. And it's been like, cause you look at, you look at the matchup and you're like the Raiders, like did you kill the Raiders? And they have to get to pull up a rabbit out of the hat. Oh, the Panthers, all oh, the Panthers stink. They win by two points. I mean, all right. To the Steelers now. Uh, I feel like I'm out on the Steelers. They have no running game. Their defense is decimated. I don't see a roadmap for this team having any sort of success uh, in January. None. I will say the the one saving grace for Pittsburgh, A, I think this is – there's no such thing as a good loss, but I think the pressure of perfection being off them now will help them get back to figuring out what they do best. They've been screwed by the schedule now multiple times, and this is an old team with an old quarterback, and I think they, they really needed that bye week, and they've been screwed out of two – bye weeks now one real bye week and then one long week after the Thanksgiving game was moved which I guess in theory turned into a long week but but either way it was a full practice week didn't have that true rest time and Roethlisberger's arm I don't think at this stage of his career is capable of throwing 50 times a game which they have to do because they can't run the ball for crap right now without James Conner they have no semblance of a running game whatsoever the offense has not been good lately you look at their 11 wins Frank do any of those stand out to you as like they impressively beat a good team, like maybe Tennessee in week five, maybe, maybe the Ravens once when they had Lamar, they probably should have lost that game. But, you know, I, I just don't look at this as a, as a team that should impose fear in other teams without Bud Dupree on the outside, without Devin Bush at middle linebacker and without any real semblance of a consistent offense. They have spark plays, but they're not going to march it downfield on you time after time again. And Washington's defense is good. I mean, defense is good, but it's not that good. It's not the Giants. I mean, so you look at their schedule. They're maybe No response down. to that real quick. No response to me with that Giants show? No, nothing? Okay, whatever. Go. Sorry, I, I, was, uh, I was looking ahead to the Steelers' schedule to find out their convincing win. So week six, 38-7 over the Browns. That was convincing. Week 10, they beat the Bengals 36 to 10. A Bengals team that's like hanging around here more recently. I believe that was Joe Burrow did play in that game. Uh, and then, other than, I mean, then they beat the Jaguars 27 to 3 in week 11. But other than that, they've played a bunch of one score games. So, yeah, they're, they haven't been like coasting at all by any means. Uh, who's the second best team in the AFC in your mind? Behind, is it, I mean, is it Pittsburgh still? Or who do you trust the most think, after the Chiefs? I actually think I trust Buffalo more. Wow, really? And that and, and let me tell you, it falls off a cliff from Kansas City to two and three. I just think Buffalo's more explosive offensively. And without Devin Bush on the opposite side of TJ Watt rushing the passer, 
I don't love the Pittsburgh defense as much as I did two weeks ago. So I think you're flipping a coin, but I think I trust Buffalo. Buffalo's physical. And Josh Allen's been playing really, really good football lately. And what he did last night to San Francisco, um, you know, it was impressive. It, it really was impressive. So I, I think I trust Buffalo a tad bit more. Maybe it's a prisoner of the moment choice because Pittsburgh lost yesterday, Buffalo won. But I think I trust Buffalo a little more. It's, uh, I mean, to your Are you point, saying I mean, Cleveland? I can't. I, I mean, I can't. Baker has had like two great games this year. Uh, he had one earlier in the year and in this game. And he's so, I mean, conventional wisdom, like I said, says Buffalo, Kansas City, AFC Championship game. Yeah. But, I mean, but Miami keeps winning too. So, like, they might win that, end up, well, no, they might end up winning that division. I, yeah, I, I need to see more from Tua before I believe they can beat a, a really good team. And that's just me personally. I, I know they beat the Rams earlier this year, but Tua had like 94 yards and that was just a fluke game. And I know he's four and one as a starter, but I need to see him either beat Buffalo, beat New England, beat, beat a good, a good defense before I, I really, I, mean, I think they're good. I think what Brian Flores has done is awesome. And what this team is, how much this team has grown is, is awesome, but I, I just don't put them in that same category yet. Switching to the Jets. So on, on Sunday, it was, it was real theater. One of, the, one of the wildest sequences of the NFL season. Probably the most into the season I've been since week one, and when, at least when it comes – since actually as a whole, but in terms of the Jets. Uh, so they were down 24-13 to the Raiders, and they – Entering the fourth quarter, sorry, 24 13 entering the fourth quarter. They get 28 24 lead, and, and everyone on Twitter is like, oh, Trevor Lawrence to the Jaguars. The Jets just blew it. They just blew it. They ruined their chances. And then at the same time, the Jaguars force overtime against the Vikings 24 24. And then the, the, everything is switched again. And then it, it was just a whole, a whole just cavalcade of just things happening. And then out of nowhere, on third down, the Jets send an all-out blitz, and Carr hits Henry Ruggs with the game-winning touchdown. And I, I was, I was a euphoric. It was, it was as excited as I've been probably at watching a Jet game in the last five years. Uh, it was a real, it was a real moment. That unfortunately, the the, the Jaguars couldn't hold up their end of the bargain, uh, which would have been unbelievable. But that that whole sequence, because I was so mad. Because here's what would have happened: if the Jets win that game, you know what the talk is all day on Monday. The Jets screwed themselves. They just ruined their chances at Trevor Lawrence because they won that game. But instead, since they lost, everyone devoted all their time to saying how, oh, what a terrible defensive call. It's one of the dumbest calls I've ever seen. Jets are an embarrassment. How, how do you lose that game? So th- they were like in an ultimate no-win situation. Either they win and they ruin them, they cost that they ruin their future forever, or they lose and they get ridiculed like they were. So that 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 really bothered me because I I'd much rather have to talk about how they screwed that game up than the fact how they how they cost themselves Trevor Lawrence a hundred out of a hundred times. Anyone who's sitting there acting like the Jets blew it, like what a disgrace, what a disgraceful call. Like, get over yourself. Here's the deal. Greg Williams and Adam Gase hate each other. They despise each other. Greg Williams is probably the most self-centered person in the entire sport. And you know that in that situation, he's probably like, you know what? I don't care if we lose this game. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be all out. And if we lose, I don't care. And he, he wants at, he wanted Adam Gase to go 0 and 16. He wants Adam Gase to have an 0 and 16 record on his coaching career. There is no doubt about it. Mina Kimes had, I think, the meme of the year. Frank, did you see this? No, I didn't see it. She said, "For anyone asking me what kind of defense the Jets are running, let me help you diagram it." And it was, oh, let me, "You go. Let, let me send you this. I want you to react to this this meme." live so you keep talking about the jets because i do agree with you they should build the statue of greg williams next to trevor lawrence on draft day they, 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 they really should so either way so what ends up happening is on uh, on monday afternoon adam gase fires or according to all the reports adam gase was the one who made the decision to fire greg williams check your twitter uh, dms all right this sorry. is this is good podcasting this is live radio i want a live reaction some people here are confused by the Jets coverage there. I diagrammed it to make it a little clearer. Hope this helps. What is that, a school bus? It's a tank, bro. It's a war tank. Do you not know what a tank looks like? I mean, I don't know what that's supposed this, to look like. Franco says this is a school bus? 
<laughs> Are you serious? What kind of school bus did you take to school, Frank? Wait, wait, wait. What, what, what? So, like, so there's a tank there. Because the jets are tanking. They blitzed oh, on. Oh, oh, oh. I thought, like, like I was oh, trying to, like, to die. Oh, my goodness. Like. Just end the podcast. That's it. <laughs> you, you, you have lost podcast privileges for a week, Frank. I'm suspending you from your own podcast for a week. That was embarrassing on your end. That, that wasn't a clear picture. But – that's not, I will tweet, I will quote tweet this after the podcast with that exact quote. But yeah, go, go on, go on. By the way, I'm thrilled the Jets lost. Uh, Greg Williams is my hero. Uh, they had the Seahawks up next. They should undoubtedly uh, lose that game too. And God willing, they'll go 0 16. Listen, I, even if they got Trevor Lawrence, there's no hope, but at least like give me, give me like the sliver of like potential of like there being somewhat of a happy future in store, even though in reality there won't be, but the fa- the thought of it is intriguing to me. And you see what the Browns have done since getting rid of Hugh Jackson at 0 16 years ago, nine and three. I still don't really trust them when push comes to shove to have legitimate postseason success, but this is the best time Cleveland has ever had in football since the early, early nineties, since the drive, since John LA uh, executed that against Cleveland. I mean, this is the best Browns year since then. So maybe the Jets, if they get Trevor Lawrence, if they are able to, you know, build some semblance of a core here with Becton uh, and Mims, who's really flashing of late, you know, they, they got they got a couple guys who you could see themselves maybe building around here in the future. So if they get Trevor Lawrence, the future could end up looking pretty decent. Could I ask you a question? No. So let's say the Jets <laughs> do win a game and Jacksonville gets Lawrence. And you guys, when I say you guys, the Jets end up with Justin Fields, who's in any other year, the number one quarterback an un- unbelievable prospect. Can the Jets fan base bu- sell themselves on Justin Fields, or is it literally Trevor Lawrence or bust? I mean, the, the drop-off from Lawrence to Fields, I think, is exponential. And honestly, if, I, if the Jets did end up with not the first pick, I would, I would try to, like, try to trade for, like, Deshaun Watson. Like, flip that pick for Watson. Like, don't, don't even, like, tease me with Justin Fields because – Listen, he may, may end up being a, an elite quarterback someday, but I, I mean, I, we'll probably play this back in five years and be like, wow, Lucas said that, that Justin Fields wasn't going to be a great NFL quarterback. But I, but I think the jury's – he's very much a question mark in terms of how great he's going to be at the next level. And I think Deshaun Watson, he needs a change of scenery in the worst way. Get, it, get, it, get him away from that. Like, like much like Carson Wentz. They both need change of scenery because Carson Wentz probably more so. The Eagles are screwed. Carson, Carson Wentz to the Jets for the second pick? No, no, no. I would, no, no, no. <laughs> but, but in terms of just, like, guys that need to change the training. But speaking of yeah. speaking about Deshaun Watson, I think he's one of the most dynamic players in the league. Uh, the whole Will Fuller, DeAndre Hopkins thing is just – I mean, he's been – that team with those weapons should be so much better. And uh, just feel like – It goes like, back to coaching. It goes back to coaching. Coaching is the X factor. And it, other sports, it does not matter as much. In football, it does matter significantly. So we'll see. I mean – I, at the end of the day, I, I would still be shocked if the Jets ended up with that first pick because they're, 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 it's, just, it's just bound to happen. They're going to screw themselves over. This, this is how these things work. Last point on the Jets and Greg Williams, and I, I heard this on, on Twitter and then on a couple of podcasts, but do you know what Greg Williams, the nickname he gave himself? I probably heard it, but I don't remember. Dr. Heat. Oh. He calls himself Dr. Heat, and if he's going to go out in any way – even if it's in a complete sabotage of Adam Gase and, you know, he, it's pretty much a kamikaze mission to send the house on that last possession, last play. If you're nicknamed, self-nicknamed Dr. Heat, you have to. You have no choice but to blitz the house there. So I kind of respect the move in the dumbest way possible because he calls himself Dr. Heat, the worst nickname and also the best nickname ever given to a defensive coordinator. So you saw this stat, like, in the history of the NFL. In that no, one's ever, no one's ever done that before. Right, which, is, which theoretically <laughs> could make it one of the most brilliant calls ever because the, what would be the last thing the Raiders would be expecting in that situation? An all-out blitz. The Jets' cornerbacks aren't that good. I know. Lamar, it was, it was, funny. It was Lamar, <laughs> Lamar Jackson against Henry Ruggs. But – Whatever. At the end of the day, they did what they had to do. They lost the game. Uh, Craig Carton called him a, a martyr. <laughs> yeah, I, really, I, really, I, I was not joking about that moment. And you said it too. That moment is pivotal, pivotal, pivotal in Jets franchise history. They should build, if, if Trevor Lawrence gets a statue ever, 
Greg Williams needs like a, a six inch statue by his toe. There has to be a little miniature Greg Williams bronze caricature statue right at the base of the Trevor Lawrence statue because he single handedly delivered you Clemson's all American quarterback. So the Jets have four games left. They're going to lose to the Seahawks on the road. They're going to lose to the Rams on the road. Then they have the Browns. Theoretically, they could win that game, but I'll, I'll say they won't win. The, the one I'm really, 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 really scared about is week 17 against the Patriots because I think there's a really, really good chance at that point in the season the Patriots will be eliminated from playoff contention. And Bill Bell's like, you know, you know, you know what will really, really satisfy me right here? Don't lie. I'm not I, love, I love where your mind's at. And oddly enough, I agree with you, Frank. I think he would tank. He would out tank Gase. He would sign Colin Kaepernick to start. He would. <laughs> he would sign. You know, all the, he would. Bring Ed, Edelman. Him. Edelman would be his starting quarterback that yeah, day. Start yeah, Edelman of course, and he would just do everything in his power to lose that game because it doesn't mean anything to him. Patriots would be eliminated, and what better way to cap off the season than to screw the Jets out of out of signing Trevor Lawrence? I mean, if they can't make the playoffs, that's the second best option for the Patriots. It really is. I mean, I thought during that Monday night game, that was that's what Belichick was thinking when the when he when the Patriots just when the Jets are just completely collapsed at the end, but had like a huge lead and just blew it in the fourth quarter. I thought that was what Belichick was thinking initially, but and then that sort of sprung more the Patriots on this run. But I'm terrified about Week 17 because that has the makings of Belichick. Screw the Jets all over it. Well, if, if they lose on Thursday to the Rams, that is legitimately in play. It really is. And you know how Belichick wants to be the best at everything. Well, Gase has taken the throne in his best of tanking. I mean, he's had been the head coach of two unbelievable tanking jobs this season alone with the Patriots and the Raiders game. And Belichick would be like, nah, watch, watch how I tank. And he'll, he might sign Kendall Hinton to be his quarterback off the Denver practice squad and be like, look, I'll go up 14 nothing with Hinton, prove I can win with him, and then we're going to just take 12 safeties in a row to give the Jets 24 points and lose the game. So last thing before we go, and we spent a lot of time talking about the National Football League, let's transition to Kyrie Irving momentarily here. Uh, so he keeps, he keeps. I mean, the season hasn't even started, and we just hate him more and more. So early, early, last week he made a comment about how he doesn't like want to talk to the media, he wants to let us play do the talking. He's still going to talk to the media. He's not doing a full season blackout, but the rate, the Kyrie Irving rate is already kickstarted. And then on, uh, on Tuesday – which were taping this podcast, LeBron James commented on something Kyrie said when they got Durant, which was uh, he finally feels confident that he has someone on the team who could take the last shot. Uh, so Kyrie is just, again, stirring the pot. And again, you know how this is going to turn out. I, I, I can already see it happening. Game one of the season against, against the Warriors. Nets are down 120 to 118. Kyrie dribble, 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 dribble. Kyrie fadeaway three, misses. Nets lose 120 to 118. And then the questions start happening. Things start compounding. The feud start building up. Kyrie gets angry. Durant starts saying things, and it just combusts. Yeah, I, I have almost no comment on this because I'm already – I'm wearing this sweatshirt because I lost a bet about Kyrie Irving to, to my good friend Eli who works for Miami. Um, I, I, when I heard that he was going to do an all-season blackout with the media, I was ecstatic. I thought that was literally the best thing for him. I really thought that was the best thing for him. And when I found out it wasn't really what he meant, I was like, oh. now, because you, it's almost to the point where you, every you, time you can't do a you can't media blackout yourself. You just can't do that. I know, but every time he talks to the media, he says something that stirs some sort of controversy, whether he intends to or not. The dude cannot avoid controversy. Yeah. He can't. Everything he says somehow is an indirect shot at somebody or it's a direct shot at somebody or it's a cryptic message to his team saying, like, the less he speaks, the better. And I got excited for the blackout. When I found out it wasn't a blackout, I was like, oh, here we go again. Next time he opens his mouth, someone's going to be mad at him or someone's going to be upset or take what he says the wrong way. And I don't think he intentionally does it all. I really don't think he intentionally does it. He kind of just speaks his mind, but sometimes it's best to just shut your mouth and let, leave it unsaid. Write it in your diary. I hope Kyrie has a diary, buys a diary this season and writes all his cryptic thoughts down in the diary. And when he gets traded from the Nets in two years, they'll, he'll release the diary as a best-selling book 
and then it'll be a tell all. And you know what? I'd rather hear it that way than through the media. That would be such an elect. That, that is a hell of an idea. That, that would, that would be, there would be so much. In, I could just see like the first take of the, like just spending three weeks, just like a page a day. Okay, like, yeah. <laughs> that might be the best idea I've ever came up with. That is brilliant. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for episode 54 <laughs> of the Lucas and Lucas podcast. You know where to find me at Lucas Frankel. See everybody next week. We'll see how this NFC East race. I, I, good luck predicting how that's going to finish. Go Giants.